All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a virtual evening with Dr. Nettie Accor for my name is Nakia Hoskins. I am the external engagement manager for the University Libraries here at UNCG. Um, and with great anticipation, we are here. I've been excited for months um, for this event to begin. And I can say that the community shares and that excitement based off the feedback I've been getting as I've been inundating your emails with emails almost daily now for the last week. So I wanna apologize for that, just making sure that you were here. Um, and so I am definitely grateful for the support, um, not only from the community, but always from the campus of UNCG and especially the support that um, the campus receives from our partner Greensboro Bound. So again, thank you all for that. Speaking of supporters, I will go ahead and introduce Brian Lampkin. He is the owner mm -hmm. of Upper Bookstore here in Greensboro. Also um, speaking on behalf of Greensboro Bound Literary Festival as he just has kind of, I think he's an octopus, right? He has tentacles and far reaches enough to support all of these great entities in Greensboro. So um, Brian, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you to help with welcome. Well, thank you, Nakia. Um, I appreciate that. Um, I am one of the founders of Greensboro Bound. And I just wanted to take a minute to thank the university libraries for their generous partnership with Greensboro Bound. Um, you know, it's um, their commitment to bring writers to uh, not only the university community, but the greater Greensboro community, and I guess tonight the entire world, <laughs> is really commendable and appreciated. Um, you know, that's an outward looking stance from the university that we should all be grateful for. Um, and just for everyone in Zoom land tonight, I want to remind you that the festival, the Greensboro Bound Literary Festival, began last night with a conversation with Roxanne Gay that was extraordinary. But you can still catch that conversation if you go to our YouTube channel, the Greensboro Bound YouTube channel. And you can catch all the rest of the exciting events uh, over the course of the weekend. Uh, you know, go to greensboroboundcom and you can register for the events there. Everything is free, of course. Um, and then um, you'll see amazing folks like Billy Collins and Bakari Sellers and Sharon Salzberg. Um, indie film legend John Sales will be part of the, the festivities. So, um, you know, just we call it 21 Conversations this year, 21 Conversations for 2021. So all these amazing writers will be in conversation with each other and uh, you'll just have a grand time. Uh, all free, greensboroboundcom register for the events there. Um, okay, I, I guess for that's about it. Enjoy your evening with Dr. Green and Dr. Okorafor. Uh, it's just incredible that we have uh, Nettie Okorafor here tonight. Um, and I just want to close by saying 40 years ago, I was a student at the University of Buffalo and I was there 40 years too soon, I'm afraid. Thank you, Nakia. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Dr. Green and Dr. Okorafor. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you, Brian. So again, I can say this. So I had the awesome opportunity to have a one-on-one with Dr. Okorafor um, a couple of weeks ago and it wasn't professional at all. And it was all me. Um, <laughs> I, it took me like 10 minutes to realize like this is like a real person. I am talking to Dr. Okorafor. So I can say based off of that small um, increment of time just speaking with her, you are in for a treat. And so remember me saying this, because at the end, I would definitely say, I told you so. I'm not prideful. I'm going to say it. So um, thank you again for everyone being here. Um, with that being said, I'll go ahead and lay out some ground rules of the format. So we are recording tonight. So with that being said, your cameras being on are optional. We're recording for those who could not attend the virtual event, but would like to see it. Also, please make sure you are muted um, the entire time, right? I'm, trying, I'm behind the scenes, so um, I'll try to be on point just in case something happens as technology, but please do your due diligence to make sure you are muted. Um, and questions, we are not um, gonna take any questions during the event. As you notice, during your first step of registration, you have the opportunity to submit questions, um, which some of them may be asked tonight, our constraint is time. If you do not, don't hear your question, it's not because it wasn't a good one. We're just working against time. We did try to pull the questions that had common themes and trends. So um, please keep that in mind as we go on. Um, again, thank you all for attending. And without um, further ado, I wanna introduce Dr. Tara Green, our moderator tonight. 
Professor Green has degrees in English from Louisiana State University and Dillard University. She has taught um, at universities in Louisiana and Arizona. She is the Linda Carlisle Excellence Professor of Women's and Gender Studies, Professor and former Director of African American and African Diaspora Studies at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. Her areas of research include Black Gender Studies, African American Autobiographies and Fiction, specifically the late 19th century through contemporary, African women's literature, African-American parent-child relationships, and African-Americans in the South. Believing that research should explore major issues of the day, Dr. Green considers how literature reflects current social and political concerns. She is an award-winning author and editor of six books in African-American literature, including the forthcoming Activism, Love, and the Respectable Life of Alice Dunbar Nelson. Dr. Green is also community, a community-engaged scholar. During the fall of 2021, she co-led UNCG's Black Lives Matter Triad Collection Project, which is an oral history archive of protesters and organizers, interviews complemented by photos and art. Moving beyond the classroom, she has received recognition for her work as a mentor. She's an active member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, a past president of the Langston Hughes Society, co-editor of Mercer University's Presses, Voices of African Diaspora Series, a voting rights activist, and a self-acclaimed political news junkie. So with that being said, let's welcome Dr. Tara Green. Thank you so much, Nakia. And thank you to Scuppernon Books, Greensboro Bound, and of course to UNCG's library, which I love. I love the librarian. So <laughs> I'm so happy to have been asked to have this conversation, lead this wonderful conversation with Anadia Korafor, whose work I have taught. So I am here to learn this evening. I will begin by introducing Dr. Okorafor. She is a Nigerian American author of Afro African Futurism and African Jujuism for children and adults. Her works include Who Fears Death in Development at HBO as a TV series, the Binti Novella Trilogy, The Book of Phoenix, The Akata Books, and Lagoon. She is the winner of the Hugo Nabella World Fantasy, Locus, and Lodestar Awards, and her de debut novel, Zara, the Windseeker, won the prestigious Woli Singinka Prize for Literature. Nettie, Dr. Korafor, has also written comics for Marvel, including Black Panther, Long Live the King, and Wakanda Forever, featuring the Dora Malaha, and the Shuri series, an African futurist comic series, LaGuardia from Dark Horse, and her short memoir, Broken Places in Outer Spaces. She is also a co-writer on the adaptation of Octo Octavia Butler's Wild Seed with Viola Davis and Kenyan film director, Wanuri Kalio. Her latest book, Remote Control, was released in January of this year. Dr. Korafor holds a PhD in literature and two master's degrees, one in journalism and the other in literature. She is an associate professor at the University of Buffalo, New York, and she splits her time between Buffalo and Chicago, where she lives with her daughter, Anyuga and her family. Learn more about her at netty.com. Dr. Korfor, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so I will begin with a couple of questions here. Please tell us about your writing journey and how you started. Oh boy, <laughs> it's a, that's a very heavy question to start with, um, even though it seems basic, but for me it's heavy because um, the way I started writing, it was so, um, it's so pivotal. So I have a, a, uh, 
the the short memoir that you talked about, Broken Places in Outer Spaces, it's all about how I became a writer because um, my journey to writing was a little bit unusual, more than a little, that is an understatement. And um, I'm just gonna sum it up really quickly because it, it just takes a long time to, to really um, tell the story of that. But the way that I started writing, I started writing when I was 20. You know, I'd never written anything, um, anything creatively. Um, I was a bit an avid reader, but you know, I, I was an athlete. I was an athlete, and I loved the sciences and all of that. But it was really complications from a spinal surgery for scoliosis when I was 19 that that kind of led me to um, to exploring exploring a creative space. So we'll just put it that way. It's a really bad, really bad summary of the fact that I went from being a mega athlete to in the hospital bed, paralyzed from the waist down with no one knowing whether I'd ever walk again. And it was not expected. It was a 1% chance, all of that. So that was really how I started writing. It was in the dark when, when this whole thing happened to me and I didn't know what else to do. And the only thing that I kind of, the only way that I kind of pulled myself out of just going into a dark place after this happened was to kind of go inward and start telling myself these stories. So that was really, it was just, you know how, um, how a lot of, a lot of creative people start doing that creative thing after something, something traumatic happens. For me, it was that cliche thing, of something traumatic happening that kind of kicked, kicked it in. And yeah, and that was really how I started writing. And since then I started writing in my hospital bed and I haven't stopped writing since then. And that was, that was like, what was that? 1993. So yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, well that um, memoir is certainly inspiring. And if, if you talk about your, um, the writing in the, the margins of iRobot, can you talk a little bit more about your writing process? Yeah, it's it's always been from the beginning, from from the first time that I wrote a story before I even knew that that's what I was doing. Because when I started writing those stories, it's like, I, I, yeah, I started writing um, around the edges of a copy of iRobot that I had because I was in so much pain, I couldn't concentrate on anything. So I started just just um, just writing these stories. And and I've always it, it's so it's always been a very therapeutic process. It's always been a very personal process. It's always been um, a process that is, is um, unconscious, subconscious, something that where I don't plot things out. I don't, you know, I, I don't have like this whole plethora of things and outlines and all of that before I start. It's just something where I just kind of spit it on the page. It just comes from somewhere else or it feels like it does. And I kind of just, you know, spit it out. And that's how it's always been from the beginning. So my writing process is very, um, it's very chaotic, you know, and I've, since then, I've written so many stories, you know, I've written so many novels and like, not all of my novels have been published. I wrote like five novels, polished, edited everything before my first novel was published. So I've been through that process many times, many times, and it's almost intuitive. And so now my writing process, I would definitely describe it as chaotic. It's chaotic. It's like gotten more chaotic, the more experience that I've gotten and, and I think a lot of it has to do with, I've told, you know, I've, I've, I've done the process of writing a novel and writing a short story and writing a novella um, so many times over and over again that it's almost, that it's almost intuitive. It's like the shape of it is just there. So it's like, I don't have to think about it. I don't have to um, like, yeah. So I think that's part of, I think that's part of where my chaotic process comes in. When did you know that you were a writer? Um, I don't know. It's like, I never, um, I, when I started writing, when I was 20, I wrote for eight years without showing my work or caring to show it to anybody. Like I wasn't concerned with getting published. I wasn't concerned with having anyone tell me it's good. I didn't care. <laughs> You know, I just was enjoying myself. I really, really, the moment I started telling stories was like finding that thing, you know, that thing that you love. 
once I found it, I was like, oh, I love this. I'm going to just do this as much as I can because I just, this is fun. I don't really need anything else from it. Just the doing of it is just so wonderful. So like, so yeah, for eight years I did that. And I, I think somewhere along the line after those eight years, I may have, it's, it was so gradual, I didn't notice. I, I never had a need to call myself a writer, to tell myself that I was a writer. I didn't have a need for that because it was just, it was so, it just came from within that like, I didn't need a label. So I didn't really need a label for it. So I don't even know. I just, it just, I don't even know. It, it was like some, somewhere along, somewhere after those eight years where I was like, okay, yeah, I guess that's what I am. <laughs> if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Sure. <clears throat> so to get more into your work, there is significant movement in your work, in your fiction. And readers can move from one African society to another within a matter of a few pages. What would you like your readers to take away from this movement? Hmm. Um, I think that I think that a lot of that comes from, okay, so, so I'm Nigerian American and my parents have been, have been taking my siblings and I back to Nigeria since we were little, like since we were very young, right? And so just my, my, my experience of the world has been painted very much by two things. One, um, being born and raised in the United States and growing up in a fairly racist neighborhood where we were the first, one of the first black families to move into our neighborhood. So we had to, and we, so we had to deal with some, they didn't like that. It, was just, it wasn't just that we were one of the first black families, but it was a very uh, racist group of people that we lived amongst. And, and we had to deal with that every day, you know, every day it was, it was the 80s, but there were some serious echoes of the 60s there. Um, and my sisters and I, my brother, he's seven years younger than me, so he didn't deal with a lot of that. Um, we had moved by then, but we were, my sisters and I we were each one year apart, so we were very lucky that we were fast, we were very athletic, so we could outrun a lot of the trouble that was coming our way, like every, every day, I'm not even exaggerating. So we grew up with that. And then my parents, around when I was seven years old, seven, my, I'm the youngest of the three, so it was seven, eight, and nine. And my brother was negative one. <laughs> yeah. Um, they started taking us back to Nigeria to connect with family and our heritage, all that. So it was like having that happen and then having this, so having that American, very American experience and then going to a country that was basically all black um, and, and, and did not have racism, has something called tribalism. Um, and then your, and your, your, your relative, your, those are your relatives, but you're from the United States. So there's, there's this weird divide. So you're connected to you. So it's all that. So I've always grown up with this idea of, you don't have to go very far to be in a different community. And also in Nigeria, mm -hmm. there's a, um, you don't have to go very far to hear a different dialect. Mm -hmm. That Nigeria is one of the, has like one of the greatest, if not the greatest number of languages, spoken languages and dialects in the world. So you don't have to go very far for people to be, to find people speaking a different language, a different dialect or a language. And of course, you know, m most people speak English there. So you're just hearing various forms of English too. So it's like, so there's that. So just moving across from, from American culture, which is very diverse, you know, within this country is very diverse and then going to Nigeria and experiencing that, I've always been aware of just that diversity, you know, just that like, so a little bit of movement and you're around a different group of people. And that's always been comfortable to me. I've always enjoyed that. I've always reveled in that. So I love writing in, you know, I, I just love, um, not that I love jumping around so much, but I love portraying that, you know, that just this diversity amongst people, there's, there's fluidity where people flow into each other and, you know, there's, there's difference and there's sameness, all of that. And that's been something that I've found really, I've always found interesting. And so part of your process obviously involves, um, you know, uh, people who 
may not write fiction in particular may think, oh, it's just whatever you sort of dream up and then you put it on the page and then the book is on the shelf. But it's clear that you um, do a great deal of research as well. Being Nigerian American doesn't mean that you know about these different um, people who live in these different countries. Can you talk a little bit more about um, your research process and integrating that into the writing and, and imagining? Yeah, I mean, it's it's complicated because it's com complicated and complex mm -hmm. because, yeah, being Nigerian American doesn't mean you know everything about everything, but you do come in knowing a lot of things, knowing a lot of things from experiencing it and living it and and growing up within it and grappling with it and arguing with it. So when it comes to when it comes to certain and, and usually with certain stories that I'm writing, a lot of my a lot of my stories are deeply based in those things. So it's not necessarily um, there are certain aspects where I'm not it's not research. It's just growing up within that. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of like, if you look at uh, Who Fears Death, it's the growing up within it that I was pulling from. Um, same with the Binti trilogy and the Akata series. You know, there's certain things where it's like, that's not research. That's, that's like, you know, uh, in, the Akata, in the Akata books, you see like things that you see a lot of masquerades, for example, which are bad summary of them are, are um, physical manifestations of the ancestors and the spirits. And I grew up around a lot of masquerades and was harassed by masquerades because we were the American kids and chased around my masquerade. Like, yeah, so like those are, that's, that's part of it. That's a large part of it. But also, you know, when it comes to other cultures, like for, for Binti, you know, the main character is Himba. Mm -hmm. And the research the research for me is like, it's not just a matter of sitting and reading the books. There's like a, it's, it's a very nonlinear process because when I wrote Binti, it wasn't that I got the idea for the story and then I decided to research about the Himba people. I already knew about the Himba people. I'd known about the, the Himba people for, for over a decade, you know, probably more than that. You know, I've been interested. So it's like a lot of times the things that wind up in my stories are things that I was just interested in to begin with and just you know obsessed about them and just dug deep within them so there so there's also that that nonlinear aspect to it and for most of the most of the um most of my stories it happens that way it's backwards it's it's like there there are there's a research that you do when you find yourself writing about something and then you have to go and learn about it but when it comes to like the really big things i tend to have Re, like obsessed with them or stumbled across them in some way, encountered them in some way before I even knew to before I even knew to write about them or that stumbling across them made me write about them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's like a nonlinear aspect to the research um, that that's that's really interesting, and I think also that begs the idea of of just being interested in the world. You know, and just being interested in those things around you and just wanting to learn about them, not because, oh, I'm going to write about them. So I want to get some, you know, I want to use this information for myself. It's just being interested in those things. And then somewhere along the line, somewhere like way down the line, you end up kind of drawing from that. So, yeah, research to me is a very um, nonlinear, multi, just multi armed thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think that spirit of exploration is is certainly that you capture that through the characters. So um, looking specifically at Binti, Binti changes significantly um, in a variety of ways over the trilogy. And then the um, there's the fourth one as well. Um, and so at one point, she asks herself at a very critical juncture, who am I? So I'm going to pose that to you as the creator of Binti. Who is Binti? Binti is, Binti is her name and her name means girl, mm -hmm. you know? She's a Himba girl. Mm -hmm. That's, and, and like that was the, be, the beginning of like, the beginning of her story was that. It's like, in, in my mind, it was like, this is this girl who ends up going on this great journey. So she's a girl. She's a, she's a she's a daughter of the soil, you know. And and for and and 
for all that that means. She's a daughter of the soil. And so like that idea could mean, um, and, and the implication is that a daughter, just a girl can be so much, can be so, so, so much. And that's, yeah, so that's what I would describe. That's who Binti is. Here's one that was submitted. I'm gonna start going into the submitted questions now. Binti is one of my all time favorite trilogies and I'm amazed at how you created such a fully fleshed world in such a short format. How do you keep your writing rich while also being concise? Yeah, that's one of my favorite things. <laughs> So like, um, I, I don't know, it's not that I'm obsessed with the idea, but like, I love the idea of just the, an economy of words. Mm -hmm. Like um, some of my favorite, favorite books are very short and they pack a punch. I just finished reading um, uh, Woman at Point Zero by Nawal Al, uh, Al Saidawi. And that book is very short. It's a, it's a, it's a, basically a novella and that book packs a point. I mean, it stays with you. It's, it's, it's an entire woman's life in those few pages. So it's like size does not necessarily mean, um, you know, this is the cliche size doesn't, doesn't have to be, yeah, size isn't everything. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm obsessed with that, you know, this idea of an economy of words and making words do as much work as possible. Every single word is at work. Um, and, and, and also this idea of, of writing something that is short enough to be consumed in a short period of time, but that, like that, how do I describe it? That, that short period of time, you're able to carry the whole story. You know, like if you're reading something that's like, I'm, I'm, a, sl I'm a slow reader. So I'm, I've always been a slow reader. So if I'm reading something that's over a thousand pages, which I've done many times, it takes me a long time. And a lot happens over that time. And I love long narratives. I love them. I'm attracted to long books. Um, I remember reading, a, a, I mentioned this on Twitter recently, a Norman Mailer book, Executioner's Song. I was attracted to that book because it was so long. I didn't know anything about the book. I just saw this huge book and I'm like, I wanna read that. So I like long narratives. But like, there's also something to be said about really short, hard hitting narratives because you can read them in a short period of time, which means you can contain the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You can contain the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I'd like the reader to get the feeling that I get as a writer. Because when I'm writing something, I, um, I, I'm, I'm the type of writer when I'm writing something, I don't stop until it's finished. Even if it's an ugly draft with inconsistencies and some, misspelled words galore all you know just ugly i have to get to the end and i i don't write linearly but the end my end quote unquote and so the reason why i have to do that is because when i'm writing a story i have to hold the whole world the whole narrative in my head all together like all of it and i can only do that for a short period of time and so like i want the reader to have that experience of containing something like a whole thing in a short period of time like with without you know, without too much time going by. So I love, um, I love that aspect, but also just this, this idea of making every single word, every single scene, everything count, everything has a weight to it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I actually teach, I was, it was recommended to me to teach to assign Binti because students will read Binti and I find that to be true. <laughs> students will read Binti even at the end of the semester after they've read so much stuff and they're so tired. So um, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> so also from one of your fans, I would be interested to hear you discuss the role of Hafa. Um, is that, am I pronouncing that correctly? Okay. And the Binti stories, particularly Binti's perception of the different norms surrounding trans people in Kush and Himba communities. Yeah. Okay. So Hafa is, she's a character I want to explore more. So I want to, you know, I want to start with that. That was like, Hafa is a character who I'm really, really interested in. Um, 
because this is the this is the this is the future but these are cultures that are working through it you know where 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 um issues of trans people have been god it's 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 been a battle you know and it's gonna it's gonna go on a different trajectory so it's like extrapolating how that has worked out in a um in a positive way because binti to me is i wouldn't call binti utopian but things have gone well <laughs> things have gone well in binti's world um and so like hafa it wasn't like it wasn't intentional where i was like okay i want to explore trans issues with by creating this character no hafa was a very um organic like a character that came along organically but when she came along like i had to really start thinking about like one i was thinking about pronouns um i was thinking about how these cultures and the cultures in binti are african and arab i mean let's be clear they're african and arab and how these cultures have worked through these these issues and how they and how could they have worked through them successfully so it's like hafa is, is proud and strong and um and she's very much a character very much a character and i want to explore like hafa is one that i that i definitely want to explore more of but i knew i knew that also that I wasn't ready to like I wanted to be I wanted to be careful and I wanted to take my time and kind of because I'm not one to just jump into the deep end, you know, just immediately jump into the deep end when I'm not sure how to fully swim like Hafa. So you only get a little bit of her in Binti, but she's one that I definitely want to um, I want to explore. I want to explore more of her character. Yeah, I think she's, yeah, she's somebody that I would love to meet Hoffa. I mean, she's like jumping around and tumbling and, and yes. she's not afraid of Binti. She just goes up to Binti and starts a, a friendship. <laughs> and that's it, you know? Oh my God, I love her. Yeah, she's great. Um, so why did you choose, again, this comes from one of the submitted questions. Why did you choose to write Binti Trilogy as three novellas? Um, I would also say that people should read the fourth one. <laughs> Do you consider the Binti stories to be parts of the same book or as separate entities on their own? They're all, they're definitely part of the same <laughs> Binti. The Binti Trilogy is basically one big story you know, like you can read it as one big story. Mm -hmm. um, and in, including the, the, what is it, a novelette? Yeah, novelette that comes with, you know, that's in the in the omnibus. Um, and the, okay, so yeah, I feel like I often have to explain how I ended up writing a novella trilogy because it was not intentional, you know, it's just not. Um, when, I, when I first wrote Binti, the first one, the, I wasn't thinking, I wasn't trying to write a novella. I was just writing the story as what it was. I just wrote this thing. And and um, and mind you, Binti was, so Binti is about a, you know, this, this African girl who goes into space to an, a, a university on another planet. And uh, she's from a very insular family. I come from a very insular family and I had just gotten, you know, I just got accepted the position at University of Buffalo. And when I left, my family basically, which I'm very close to, like, you know, very close to, basically disowned me for a year. So that was how I wrote Binti. That was why I wrote Binti. I arrived in, in Buffalo and I was like, have I made the biggest, <laughs> have I made the biggest mistake of my life? I've just left, you know, the, left Illinois. Everyone is in Chicago, the Chicago area. I'm suddenly in Buffalo, New York. And so like, you know, as I said, the way that a lot of the inspiration when I'm writing is always from, it's a therapeutic thing. So I just kind of put all of my pain onto the page. Mm -hmm. And and then that one element of, okay, well, what if it was a terrible mistake? And so I kind of just leaned into that. So Binti leaves her family to go to this university. And then I have the worst thing I could think of happen to her. So that was where that twist came from. Because I was like, I leaned into this idea of what if I did make a terrible mistake? That's where 
that's how I wrote Binti. So Binti, it wasn't contracted. It wasn't a novella that was contracted or anything. It was just a story that I just wrote because I needed to, you know? And so when it finished, it was, it was a certain length. And I was like, what is this? I, I had to Google what it was. Cause I'm like, this is not a novel. Googled what it was, found that it was a novella. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And then I talked to my agent to figure out how one sells a novella because I wasn't sure how to do that. And so once it sold before, um, around the same time the next year, it just like, I, I didn't think I was like, I, I knew there was more to the story, but I was like, yeah, I always have lots of ideas. I'll return to it when it happens, you know? And then exactly a year later, I had, it just came to me. The, th the second part just came to me. I wrote the thing, sent it to my, my publisher, tour.com. They were like, oh my gosh, they were completely shocked. <laughs> you know, cause I just, I just wrote it. I, cause I'm not gonna, I, I tend to keep these things secret when I'm writing something because I don't want any feedback yet. <laughs> so, so I just wrote it and then submitted it. And then the next year, the same thing happened. So each time I wrote it, I had no idea I was gonna write it. And then each time the length was not something I thought about at all. I just wrote it to length. So if you notice the, the Binti stories get longer and longer, you know, it's because I, I was just writing however long the story was. I wasn't writing to a length. I wasn't writing a novella trilogy like consciously. So it just happened that way. And I was lucky that I had a publisher who was really open to all of that, um, to all of my spontaneity and unpredictable whatever, because they didn't, each time they got one of one from me, they did not know it was coming. Like literally, they didn't. I kept the emails where my, my editor was like, what? Oh my God, this is great. You know, so like, um, so yeah, it ended up being, it ended up being a novella trilogy, but it wasn't, it wasn't intentional. You know, that's why in the omnibus, there's also a novelette in there because I wrote one. <laughs> so yeah, that was, that was how that happened. So is that one the last or are we going to hear more about Binti? I, we'll see. I, I know there's more. So, okay. So Binti has been, has been optioned and that's being in, that's in development as a TV series. So it's like right now, I will say the only reason, okay, so the, the novelette that I wrote was inspired because I was the, um, I, it, you know, it wasn't just option, I'm writing the, I'm co-writing the, the, I have co-written the screenplay for the first episode. So when, when we were brainstorming for the first episode, that was what just spawned a new Binti story. Like, I'm like, oh, I gotta write this. This is just, this is more of, this is more of the story. I'm exploring the world, so this is more of the story. So. Yeah, with the TV series happening, it's like, um, gosh, just, just dwelling in that world. I already know there's so much more. I already know. So it's like, I'm just kind of keep, keeping my, keeping it in control while they, you know, while it's in development. But yeah, it's highly possible. <laughs> I'll just say that. It's, it's highly possible. Yeah, yeah. So we'll look for that. <laughs> um, I want to ask you a question about the tree. Um, you know, she goes through so much, but then when we read your memoir, that is, is an experience that you've had. It's a sort of, um, so for people who have no idea what I'm talking about, what is treeing and uh, why are, why is it there? Why do you use that as, as a way? It's, it's part of Binti's identity. Yeah. Okay. So so treeing, the, the original term treeing, it's a tennis term. So I played semi-pro tennis from the age of nine to 19, right? So like one of the terms when you're treeing in tennis, it's like, it's like when you're playing out of your mind, you can do no wrong. Treeing can last for, or for 30 seconds, it could last five minutes. But you, when you're, when you're, when you're treeing, it's like, everything aligns. You can put the ball wherever you want it to go. You can make your opponent do whatever you want them to do. You will hit like five aces in a row. I've treed many times. <laughs> like I know the term well, and it's, um, it's like, it's the most magical feeling. It's the clarity. It's like, um, at one point I remember I was treeing so hard that I could see through time. Like, I'm not even kidding. I could see through time. I knew where the ball was going to go before it got there. 
for an extended period. It was like it lasted for about three minutes. Like I knew everything that was going to happen before it happened. So it was not for like a long period of time, but it was, you know, a second or two, which is a long time in a, during a point. So it's like, so that's a term, like my sisters know, we all know it, it's a, it's a tennis term. So, so, you know, I'm familiar with that. And so when, I'm, when I was writing Binti and she's, she, she's her, uh, her, I don't wanna call it her sport, her talent, is mathematics and there's something about math like i could see the, the parallel with it like because like one of my strong one of my strong areas in school was also math and i'd know that like there I, i'd be able to do certain equations really quickly just there, there'd be a clarity there where i wouldn't have to think like some other part of my brain was thinking not the conscious one so i could do that and so like i can make that connection between sports and mathematics and that's really where that connection came from so when i'm writing about binti and she's like this mathematical genius and to the point where she can like she can um uh draw up the energy of the earth by using mathematics and meditation so like it, it's treeing to me it just made it just made sense and so that was where like the term just transferred right over into what binti is doing because like once I once I applied that term to what Binti's doing, it became very clear, you know, exact like the extent of it. And then and then once I applied that term and understood it, then I knew how it would work in the plot. I knew, I knew when she would need it, you know. I knew that that would be a place that she would go, that she would descend into, and that she would use, and and that it would require, um, that it requires a certain kind of mind to to access that so so yeah it's it's yeah it's an interesting um interesting concept but i i yeah i know i know exactly exactly where it came from great um so looking at your work more generally we had some questions about that mm -hmm. women girls and female entities figure prominently in your work and what do you hope to achieve through the development of those characters? Um, I think that like I, one thing that I definitely hope to achieve is that to get people more familiar with the idea of complex, um, strong, complex, flawed female characters, especially African ones. You know, I, I'd want, I want readers to normalize that. Ones that make mistakes, terrible. <laughs> mistakes but do extraordinary things one, ones that come from they, that don't come from royalty or greatness they're just they just are girls or women um and and still go on to make decisions that lead them wherever they you know that lead them to to do great things um I, i'd want to normalize that i'd want to uh you know just make that something that when you see it, you're not like thinking that's totally unrealistic. And I'd want I'd want uh, readers to come away with really being able to imagine that in multiple forms. Like it, like I, I've written I've written physically powerful female characters. I've written female characters who um, who like brute strength is not their superpower. Binti is small, and she is not somebody who's going to go and beat someone up. Whereas, whereas Oni Soma on the other hand will will knock your head off. But like, um, so I'd I'd want those you know that I'd, I'd want to normalize that variety, that diversity, um, and, and just yeah, all of that. So um, focusing on African women, African female entities. Um, what do you think is next or maybe should be next for African futurism as a genre? Um, I have a novel called Noor coming out. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I know what I do. Mm -hmm. I know what I'm interested in. I know that like um, that that people often think they know where I'm going and it's never where I'm going. <laughs> Like I'm this, I'm never going in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, that, but I also, you know, I, I'm just one who 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 thrives, vibes, and likes to exist in chaos. So I don't know what's next. I'm excited about whatever comes next. Uh, I don't, 
you know, um, I know what I write. Mm -hmm. I can't predict what others will write, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm excited about it. Mm -hmm. So what changes in your writing process when the primary audience is children or young people as opposed to adults? Um, I think that the biggest difference is that if I'm writing something for adults, and, and this is where like a lot of my work tends to be categorized as young adult, and it's kind of problematic when it happens because I'm like, um, it's like all of my work, <laughs> even my novel Lagoon has been labeled young adult, which makes no sense. Mm -hmm. But like, I think one of the, the biggest differences is like if I'm writing something for young adults versus adult children, it's a different, just completely different because a picture book is a completely different process, everything, but young adult and adult for me, um, if, if, and, and mind you, I, I think it would be better if you go by my labels of young, what's young adult and adult versus what a lot of other people label, because this does not apply. What I'm about to say just is not correct with uh, what I've seen out there when it comes to labeling my work. But like, um, for me, the one thing, the one main difference is that in, uh, in adult works, I don't feel this need to, it's not explain, I don't feel a responsibility. <laughs> like I could just do it, you know, like if I, if there's something that I want to tell, something that I want, like who fears death, which people have often labeled as young adult. And I'm like, are you crazy? Are no, you it's crazy? not. <laughs> like, are you seriously? Yeah, it's not, it's not. And when I wrote that, there were no, it was no hold bar when I wrote that. I would never write that book for a young adult. Like when you say four, it means like for that age group. I would never write Who Fears Death for young adults. Never. Like that's almost like I'm a mother here. Like I would never. Um, so when I wrote Who Fears Death, I was not like, there was, there were no constraints on how I told the story. There are certain scenes in Who Fears Death where I suffered in writing those scenes. Like I, I'm just like, I don't know if I'm going to do that again. Or I, I this, it was, it's like that. If, if it's a young adult work, I'm not going to do, if I, I may go dark, I may go painful, I may go disturbing, but there's a certain responsibility that I'd have to write it in such a way where, um, it's not th that I, that I would explain, but I'd be, I'd be a little more careful. I'd set the reader down more carefully. Whereas in an adult, in a, an adult narrative, I will throw you down on the floor and you will be fine. You know, because I know you're an adult, you'll be fine. But young adult, you know, after I hurt you, I'll put you down carefully. Like that. That's the difference. If there's, there's any other way to describe it. Oh God, this is being recorded. Okay, well, all right, I've said it. <laughs> Well, and I also wanted to ask about, um, because there is that scene, you know, a few pages in and, and Binti where, where, you know, there's blood. I won't, for people who haven't read it, I don't want to say, say, what, say what happens, but there's blood and then there's a transformation. There's a coming together with um, Aku. And so um, does she forgive him? Is it, are you doing something there with forgiveness? Yeah, there's a lot there. There's a lot. Um, I remember reading reviews of, of Binti where they were like, how could she, you know, how could she possibly even reconcile or be friends with this, you know, this alien who did blah, 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 how did it? And I'm like, do you guys really think that that did not, that was not fully on my mind as I'm writing this thing, mm -hmm. really? Um, that, that was a very complex, that's, that's one of the, that's one of the amazing things about the character, about Binti. That's the point. Like mm -hmm. most people would not be able to ever, ever deal with the Medus, like full stop. But like Binti, she, she's got this, this transcending quality where like, she's able to take, she's probably one of the strongest characters I've written. She's mm -hmm. able to take like take pain and anguish and, and, fa and not just like take it in and just suppress it. She faces it. 
she faces those things. And, and so it's like, it's painful for her to deal with Opu. It is very difficult for her to deal with Opu, but she does it. She does it and she deals with it every time she deals with Opu. Every time it passes through her head, seeing her, her friend, Heru, ex his chest explode, you know, in her, it, right before her. She always will remember that, always. And yet she's still able to see the history of it and the layers of it and, 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 and dialogue with it. Like she's still able to dialogue with it. That's like, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. So, so it's, it's really a testament to who Binti is, like how she deals with Oku and the closeness that they have. And then what ends up, you know, what ends up happening down the line and what I know in my head, what will definitely end up happening, you know, beyond the books, it's like, um, it's quite extraordinary. It's quite extraordinary. She's, she's really, truly extraordinary. And there's a, there's a, a, a power that she has that I think is really um, something that we need now, you know, yeah. in terms of just being able to negotiate and face and, and deal with all these things that are very, very painful mm -hmm. and still come out of it. It's just, yeah, she's, she's very extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I find important about Binti is that uh, what happens to her is not thrown away, that somehow she just gets over it, that you allow us to see how she deals with it, um, whom she allows to help her in the dealing with it, um, that, it's, that it's a process. Mm -hmm. And so um, that, that just seems important. Um, you know, as, as we talk about peace and violence and, and yes. some other things, it yeah, it's, it's certainly relevant now. A uh, couple of more questions as our time dwindles. Someone has a question about genre. Do you consider your books firmly in one genre or the other? You've talked a little bit about that. Or um, might a novella be something else? May, may a... Um, a comic be something else with how do you look at genre yeah um i mean there's there's all, always my conversation about african futurism you know which i really don't want to get into but like um uh outside of that it's like i don't even like to think much about genre because it's it's the, the, and I think a lot of that has to do with the way that I write. The stories just come from, they just, they just come the way they come and I don't, I can't control they are and I never fit into, I never perfectly fit into any genre. So there's that, which is, an, you know, it's, it's a little annoying. Sometimes I wish I could write something that was solidly something. Like, I don't even think I'm solidly, sometimes I am African futurist, sometimes I'm just bordering on a lot of a lot of different things. So um, I, I think I want to say that I, I leave that up to others, but I've seen what happens. <laughs> so I, I leave it up to others with a grain of salt because a lot of times there there are there are a lot of politics involved in labels, a lot of politics. So um, I'm aware of that, but I I don't know. Um, I guess I mean. Uh, you know, I write African futurism and African jujuism and science fiction and fantasy, and then th other things too. You know, I, I could one day write something that's none of those, and mm -hmm. I feel like I should be free to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I could totally see myself writing something that's 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 none of those things, and and um, um, yeah, I don't see myself like letting those those labels find ideas that I have. Yeah. Um, and so for folks who haven't read it, Broken Places and Outer Spaces, you do um, clarify what you mean by African futurism, which is not the same thing, though um, it could be related to Afrofuturism. So I want to make sure that people understand that we are intentionally um, following your lead, I am intentionally saying African futurism. I'm not misquoting, misspelling, or mispronouncing anything there. <laughs> <laughs> so one last question here. Uh, what are you reading currently? You've mentioned one text 
what else might we um, think about as we think about your work? What are you reading? Um, what am I reading? Um, well, I was reading Ed Chang's The Story of Our Life. Um, that was yesterday. So, I, I mean, I jump around a lot. Um, I was just reading before that. I was reading uh, Ngugi Wathiango's latest, this, the, the prose poem. It's like one long prose poem. I just read Ben Okri's, is it Escape Artist? I think so. Um, yeah, so I jump around. I jump around a lot. It depends, like, I just, I was reading Carl Sagan's Contact. Yeah, these are all the things that I've been reading, like, in the, in the last, in the last month when I, when I have, when I have time. So, yeah, I, I jump around a lot. Mm -hmm. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Yeah, I don't, I think that we would expect that, that you, <laughs> that you read broadly. Well, Dr. Corfor, it has certainly been a pleasure talking with you about your work. Thank you so much for giving us your time on this Friday evening. And we look forward, I know I do, to, um, I'm, I'm so excited about the idea of seeing um, Aku um, floating on the, on the screen. <laughs> but any of your work that's going to be on the screen, we are definitely going to tune in. So thank you and best wishes to you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Um, before you go, may I ask if you want to, do you want to talk about your latest release? Oh, yeah. Um, latest release. Oh, I can't even show. Come on. <laughs> but um, yeah, the latest release is, um, can't see it, but Remote Control. It's a novella. And it's it takes place in a, thank you. <laughs> it takes place in a near future, near future Ghana. Um, and it features the daughter of the adopted daughter of death. There's a lot to it. It's solid. Yeah, this one I could say is solid African futurism. Gotcha. Thank you. Well, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If I knew any other words right now, I would say it, but I told you so comes to mind, right? So when I first got on here, I told people after my one-on-one -on -one with you that all of the anticipation would definitely be worth it. And so I could listen to you all night. One, you're just like soothing, like audibly, and then two, processing what you're actually saying. So thank you to Dr. Green. Thank you um, for hanging in there with me. I know me, so I, <laughs> I know what that means. So thank you for agreeing and participating. Again, thank you, um, Dr. Cora, for thank you to Greensboro Bound um, Literary Festival, those who are working behind the scenes. And a special thank you to the UNCG Alumni and Friends Virtual Book Club. They actually adopted the Binti um, series as the book that they were reading from March to May, gearing up um, to have this event. Um, our last um, speaker will be our interim dean at the University Libraries, Mike Crumpton. Um, he's going to close us out. And then after that, um, I hope to see all these squares and faces at the next Greensboro Bound event. Thank you, Nakia. Uh, thank you, Dr. Akar, for, for a wonderful evening. I mean, this was this was fantastic. So we appreciate having you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Green, thank you so much for managing this session tonight and, and uh, keeping us uh, entertained with the questions and, um, and inquisitive. Uh, thank you to Brian for uh, making uh, Greensboro Bound a venue that we can uh, come, come together and share these kind of amazing works uh, across the board. And I invite you to continue to look at Greensboro Bound venues for the rest of the weekend. Thank you, Nakia. Nakia is the strength behind all of this, pulling it all together and making sure everybody is where they're supposed to be, when they're supposed to be, and happy. So thank you, Nakia. And I want to thank all of you. Uh, the University Libraries is really proud to be part of this type of uh, event, um, you know, bringing uh, strength to education and literature. And so your participation is what makes it happen. So thank you again for everyone. And uh, Hope to see you again soon, okay? Good night. <laughs>